before we bring Jay on, we have Jay here waiting for us. Before we bring him on, I do want to just kind of explain what's going on. So I originally, I originally first reached out to Des Redding uh, because I saw you know this post got shared to me that Des posted on Instagram, and I'm just gonna read through it just so everyone is under. We all have the same context of what's going on here. So it starts like this: My World Championship has come to an abrupt end. Today, despite being personally hydrated and feeling ready, the lack of water on the course combined with 90 plus heat and some hot flashes did me in and almost three others that I know of. It is a wonder why there is a recommended PDGA water policy when the PDGA doesn't follow its own recommendations. Our course had a water jug on hole one and one other jug placed at the shared junction of eight and 11. It was simply not enough. I was cooked, lost my mind, uncontrollable shaking, no idea how to operate my phone, seeing double basket. I left the course for self-preservation. Tournament staff walked me back to my rig where I iced myself down. Jay furiously drove to me and we went to urgent care per the PDGA. Luckily, two hot geese were there to keep me company. My vital signs came back good. All my icing and knowledge kept the worst at bay. Thanks to my car mates, especially Valerie and everyone for checking in. I appreciate the love and concern. She continues. Um, she continues on with a photo, uh, which is, I believe, the PDGA policy. I didn't know this existed, Yuli. I mean, it's like it's like seven or eight bullet points. There's a graph at the bottom that shows like outside temperature, how much water per player. I mean, it's a very detailed. Of like what you need to be doing with water, thirsty. and yeah, I know. And apparently, at uh, at one of their bigger events, one of their flagship events, their world championships, right? Uh, they didn't have enough water on the course, so we bring on uh, bring in Jay Redding. You might know him better as Yeti, joining the show for the first time. How's it going? Appreciate you jumping on for us tonight. Absolutely, howdy right, guys. How y'all doing? We're doing good. We're doing good. All right, so uh, I kind of just explained Dez's post on Instagram, kind of gave a little bit of a background of what's going on. Is there anything else that you want to fill in that maybe I didn't, you know, that wasn't in her post? Uh, no, Dez is doing really good, actually. Um, you know, I was glad that you shared your story, Brody, with uh, having heat stroke before because, uh, you know, heat stroke, heat exhaustion, they're related, but they're different. Uh, heat stroke is definitely the extreme side of it. I mean, just the word stroke uh, means your brain is having an issue with what's going on physically. Uh, and Des has had a heat stroke in the past. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, it's tied to a, a PDGA event that is now on one of our elite tours. And uh, they sent the FPO to a course out in the country. And, at, and that year, there was actually zero water available on the course. Hmm. So, uh, you know, one thing led to another. Uh, I think in that case, uh, what because Des has always been a, a, a hydrator. I think at that point in our career, she actually flushed out her system with just water, uh, you know, and uh, that can be a bad thing too. So if we're going to start out with a, a tip for everybody, you know, hydration is, of course, the amount of water that your body is uh, holding on to, uh, but you also need electrolytes or salt that also helps you retain that water. Otherwise, you literally, if you think about your body as a radiator, you are just flushing out the radiator and the radiator's entire existence in a car is to keep that car running cool for all those hot engine parts. So she has had that and uh, as you know, Brody, and I'm sure you are now too, once you have that, you actually are uh, very susceptible to the right combination uh, in the right situation and with deaths, uh, you know, I can give you our rundown. We were so prepared for this uh, uh, um, bizarrely weather in uh, in Kansas at this point in uh, the summer, uh, which was 90 degrees with 100 plus heat index, 85 mm. percent humidity, so just soupy, soupy thick. Um, you know, that's having some hot flashes as well uh, as well. I'm sure other age protected folks as things, but they all kind of comboed in. Um, Pre-Worlds, we bought 12 actual pull-the-top-off drink Pedialytes, a box of powdered Pedialytes, two boxes of the IV, the new kind of 
uh, IV electrolyte uh, deal. We even had Pedialyte popsicles. So I'm pretty sure the hydration level was pretty solid. However, what that means is that you're going into battle with what you stored in your body the night before. And then it's a matter of continuation of drinking water while you're performing athletics to keep everything going. Um, you know, and so if, if we jump in right there, um, you know, you saw the policy right there. And, and I, I was on the competition committee, guys, from 2005 to 2015. Uh, just to let your viewers know the difference, you know, the there's a rules committee and there's a competition committee. The rules committee actually literally does rules, everything that is enforceable, uh, you know, the uh, all of those rules. The competition uh, might not be surrounded exactly in rules. I always say all rules have to do with competition, but competition mm -hmm. items don't necessarily have to do with the rules. Um, so, yep. We, we helped uh, the PVJ staff is actually who came up with the finalized version of this PVJ water policy. Now you can read in there and they use a lot of uh, uh, words like recommended. Um, however, you know, I guess my first big, you know, thing would be, you know, how is any other tournament, C tier, B tier, A tier, DGPT, supposed to follow even a recommended policy if, the people that created aren't following it themselves. And so in this situation, on this course, there was one jug of five gallons on hole one, and there was one gallon of five, one, one jug of five gallons at a little bit of a cross section between eight and 10. So, you know, the whole one water, you know, we, we, everybody, you know, if you're the guy that's like pounding that right before competition, you're really glad it's there. But most of us competing know we need to show up on hole one, loaded up and ready to go. So that one's almost a moot bucket. Doesn't make you know? sense to have too much. So, yeah, man, you know, that's, that's just uh, that part of it. But, you know, I, and I'll go into all kinds of this stuff, but, but, I do want to establish right off the bat, guys, uh, congratulations to all the world champions. Uh, they put it out. They put it forward. I also want to totally commend the, the host uh, parties and the committees. Uh, without them putting in all the hard work, you know, Worlds doesn't happen. And the cool thing with Worlds is that it actually does change from spot to spot. You know, it's pretty cool. You guys are in Virginia in the open worlds this year. Uh, U.S. Masters will be in Raleigh. Uh, you know, all these different cities are inviting. They're putting and pulling all the stops to invite in the world's top talent to come and see. And I also wanted to uh, then say thank you and acknowledge the phenomenal effort that all of the hosting groups put together to, to host the world championship or any time that the pro tour, we have so many people behind the scenes. There are just endless amounts of volunteers and folks even that get paid, but they don't get paid very much. You know, we can't take that for granted. And you're going to notice I'm not going to beat up on them uh, much. And, and there was missteps there as well. Uh, but there is one common denominator, and that's our organization. Uh, th the organization has their name. Uh, first and foremost on the world championships and almost all of our majors. In fact, I, there really was a, a, a decision-making process that decided, you know what, maybe the PDG isn't uh, in the game for running the national tour, the elite series. And the pro tour has done an, a fantastic job of actually taking that on, uh, overcoming a, a tremendous amount of burden that it takes to have so many employees, it takes to run the pro tour the correct way. The PDJ kind of like, all right, we're done with that. So now what are we doing? Well, we're organizing competition. We're sanctioning competition and we own with our own name majors. So the PDJ needs to double, triple down, you know, right now and save themselves by owning the events that they own. And, uh, you know, we, uh, I'm sure you guys talked about some of this, you know, water isn't the only issue here. Yeah. Uh, and I do want to iterate that Des was hydrated. So she was, you know, pe people are saying, you know, like, well, 
you know, she didn't have enough water on the course herself. Well, sure, I suppose everybody could. You know, Ellen Wood Widboom, who's a military background, she carries around an actual gallon of water. You know, that's the, that's her training. They they do rucks in situations that are life threatening um, in those situations. So, uh, but it is absolutely on uh, the event side to to take care of the players. At the end of the day, you guys disagree or agree with me. This is what players want. We want to know what tees we're teeing from. We want to know what the distances are. Uh, a par is actually helpful. Uh, we want to know what the rules of each hole are. We want to know what the OB parameters are, what any special uh, circumstances are. And then we want those holes trimmed and groomed the best it can be for not only competition but for viewership and things like that i mean at the end of the day it's simple right yeah it's not too much to ask i don't think right so you know we go back to things that we've done over and over again the competition I, when i tuned back in i heard you guys saying like well there's no enforcement and that really becomes the stick and carrot situation that is the million dollar question uh back when, when the competition committee was really, really clicking and we had, uh, you know, Kevin McCoy, who was touring and Avery Jenkins, who was touring myself, we had some of the finest tournament directors in the land. And we put together uh, a checklist, a uh, standards, if you will, like if the tournaments would just do these things, everybody competing is actually going to be pretty darn happy. And they're the same things y'all are battling today. It's the, T pads. It's the consistency in the targets. It's the marking. It's how many days ahead of time are we saying that this is it? You know, at a world championship when people are, you know, Joe Revere spent two weeks in Emporia ahead of the week before the championship. Mm -hmm. So I guarantee you, when he showed up, he was just throwing discs in a field for the most part. Sure, those those courses are laid out on on new disc and stuff, but that's where I'm saying like. Um, you know, things like, uh, we actually, uh, one group had a swinging target, you know, Yuli, did you play in the uh, 2005 world championships in Pennsylvania? No, no, I was so, so, a little before my time. So an incredible course in a state preserve, but it had a swinging target from a magnificent tree. And all of us are like, what really <laughs> are we doing this? And they decided right last second, no, you guys are actually right. And we, we're, we'll tether it to the ground and this will never happen again. You're right. Well, fast forward, I heard that it uh, happened, I think in 2017. And now you can add 2024 to the list as well. I pulled in, <laughs> uh, my buddies gave me a ride back to the course and uh, the women were putting out and it was so windy. We were just watching this target, just swinging in the wind. <laughs> we were making bets like, well, what do you think? Is it gonna be a missed putt or a, a missed target? <laughs> uh, and that's, you know, again, seems elementary as well. Um, you know, things like that. But, uh, uh, you know, we can talk about some other things. I, I, would, I would love to answer anything you guys have, but, but I want to make sure that I put this in here is that, um, um, you know, I was asked to give some feedback and the biggest thing, um, and this was even, uh, so our new executive director, Doug Bierkus, uh, one of the things that was amazing was he is actually on site from the beginning of worlds to the end. So he was there and he was taking notes and he was checking things out and he actually, uh, had a meeting specifically with Dessa and I, and, and it actually was, uh, we were going to have a meeting anyway. So it wasn't really because of this. But I tell you what, Doug sat there and he listened and he listened and he did say there is going to be accountability. And he did say that things are, are under his watch are going to get better. And I believe him. Um, I'm, I've got a, a lot of faith. I've known Doug for a long time. And uh, I think, uh, you know, I think, I think things, hopefully maybe this is a catalyst, you know, uh, although I, I can't tell you how many times I thought that we had a catalyst moment uh, you know, out on tour or at a, a championship or something like that. But, uh, the PDJ needs to obviously be on site boots on the ground, two weeks ahead of worlds, not coming in the week of, and then putting on fire helmets and trying to get all the fires put out that maybe the local group couldn't quite handle or whatever it is, or painting the lines last second or changing, uh, 
You know, they put, you know, the flooding, we know we got to give some credit to mother nature. They threw some curveballs on there. So I, I didn't want to try to talk about some of those because I think the host group did darn near the best they could given those circumstances of flooding out holes. Although if I'm going to be critical of something with that, it's communication, mm. you know, send out notifications more than you think that you should let keep us in the loop. You know, just don't let us hang. You know, they're, they're saying, uh, you know, for the, uh, for the groups that played Peter Pan, that, that flood happened. Uh, the river actually rose up the day before it was Opie. You couldn't even drive into the course. Oh, it wow. was so flooded. So they knew like, okay, well this might, we might not even play this course period. So that word kind of trickled out. Uh, but Peter Pan, the river rose the next day, and all of a sudden those six holes became unplayable, and they kicked into action, and they, you know, put in temp holes. However, the temp holes meant that they pulled out some crusty restaurant rubber oh, tea no. pads and threw them on the ground, rippling, uh, you know, horrible teeing surface, and then, thank goodness, they ended up putting – uh, tee off from the earth if you'd want to as well. So they did mitigate that. Uh, but where were these turf pads at? You know, shouldn't there be uh, uh, temporary turf pads in the PDJ trailer? Shouldn't there be 20 water jugs in the PDJ trailer waiting for events uh, and things like that? So that's where I just th think that, you know, we just, we have, I, not, I'm not saying we can do better. We have to do better. You know, we, we have, you guys are just starting to do this for, Ten thousand, twelve thousand dollars a pop. You know, when we were doing it at, man, I won twelve hundred bucks this weekend. Let's go. You know, there was a, maybe a little bit. Well, you're really doing it for a living. You know, well, yes, some of us absolutely were, and we were making it happen. And now that there's big money, and I'm saying you guys are on another level, uh, but our age players are too. We're all members. We all are invested into this organization, and I think the. The MP uh, 70s and the FA 65s are just as important as MPO and FPO. At the end of the day, they mean different things, but doggone it, those people work hard. Uh, if you look at the women's uh, turnout, uh, I, I, I didn't quite get the stat with the put stat Mando on it. Um, there were women's world champions represented at this world of like uh, 16 of the first 20 years of the PDGA's world championships for FPO. Hmm. So that's the legacy players, you know, do we really want to be treating, you know, our, our legends and our hall of famers that way, let alone our amateurs who now are maybe just finding the sport and they dumped in all their cash and they, this summer I'm going to qualify for next year's worlds. And it really means something to them. Um, so I'll, I'll let you guys wrap a little bit on that. Yeah, no, I think, I think you make great points. And I think the, what the PDJ has is like a lot of people go to these events and they're assuming like this is a massive event. This is a big deal. And when you show up and certain things aren't there that are expected, I think it really does hurt the future of the sport for that person. Cause they might just literally be like, well, this sucks. I paid all this money to come all the way out here and this thing is run like a flag football tournament in my back, you know, my, my local park. Like I, I, a lot of that. And, and we don't really, ha and that's one thing that's kind of missing a little bit, uh, even on the pro tour side is like the pageantry, you know, like a lot of pro tour events and they're getting better, but a lot of pro tour events still, it feels like you're just walking into a local park. So there, there isn't this feeling of like, oh, this is special. And um, I'm not saying that that needs to be happening on the amateur side of things, but um, there are certain things that I think, you know, one thing that I don't even really, you know, pay attention to as much as I should is bathrooms because I have the ability to just go into the woods whenever I want. But when you start looking on some of these disc golf pro tour events that we've played at, and I know it's got a lot better, but the last couple of years, like there was times where it's like, bro, if you're if you're female, like what are you doing? Like you're you just can't go to the bathroom for nine, ten holes. So there, there's a lot of things that need to be corrected. Yuli, did you have anything to uh, add to that? 
No, I, I just wanted to add again, like, I feel like my main point with this whole thing where, where I feel like it trickles down is, is from the top is leadership. And, and it's funny that you brought up Doug Bajerkis cause I was giving him high praise before you came back on saying when we go, when we were to go to play the GBO or the glass blown open, or what is it now? It's a dynamic dis open. Yeah. yeah. The dynamic dis open. And he was running things. I felt like it was one of the smoothest tournaments ever. Um, and then I see that Eric McCabe's playing and playing the event. So he's a guy that gets a lot of things done. And when there's not good leadership going on, and this isn't a knock to whoever's running the tournament or whatever the staff, but when there's not one guy being like, okay, I know how to run tournaments. This is what we do. Make sure that this guy's doing this on this course. Make sure this guy's doing this on this course. Make sure that we make sure that those waters are done. If not, we may get somebody on that. It, all the good tournaments, for the most part that I see, have somebody like that who's doing it, right? And it's interesting that all the tournaments that are run by the PDJ, not all, some of them are really great, but we see little leaks. We see little leaks of things go kind of under the radar to where we're like, well, why didn't that get taken care of? And they're like, well, I thought he was going to do it. And whenever you get the pointing fingers thing, that's because there's nobody to look to and nobody like really setting the standards of, no, this is how we do it. This is the way that we do it. And we need to keep it doing it, doing it that way. And when I heard all these things happen, that's the first thing that I thought I was like, well, Eric's not. And I, I bring up Eric just because I know he's a go getter and he gets stuff done. Right. And Doug, he's a go getter. And it's funny that you said like right after he's like, no, people are going to, people are going to catch some flack for this because under my watch, this wouldn't have happened. And this isn't, you know, this isn't respectable. And I just yeah, feel I like that. It, I, I just feel like that that's like one of the main issues that I see when the PDJ comes to town is there's nobody that's just, all right, let's get this done. You know? And, and there needs to be more people, right? So even if there is that person, that person needs to have people that actually directly 100%. answer to them, right? Because otherwise you go back to the volunteer uh, hosting staff where, you know, that there isn't a, um, there isn't that stick and carrot that we were talking about, that enforcement situation, you know, like, oh, I got to go pick up my kids too. So maybe I'll get to that course tomorrow <laughs> and figure out totally. that. Uh you know, and we, and we understand that, but, uh, yeah, I, I think you're right. I think it just, it, it, it we just, we, the sport, uh, is to the point where there needs to be a, a small, a small army of, uh, competent folks that are coming in and, and representing and, you know, pounding down the, the PDGA feather flags yes. are, are only, only the 20th step, you know, I yeah. mean, we want to address it, but boy, yeah. there's so many other concerns first. And, 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 and one of the things that I, and I might be completely off with this is why are we having a world's in Emporia this time of year when it's 90 degrees and flooding all the time and there's weather coming in and we've known this forever. Like I know it's a bidding process, but who goes, yep, you get it. You know, this is a good, this is a great idea type thing. When you have 80 year old playing in this tournament in 90 with a hundred heat index, like, that seems a little crazy to me. Yeah. It, no, it's and it's a great point, Yuli. In fact, that's kind of one of my other little marks on here was uh, for a master's age protected worlds, every single division played a course that was totally not appropriate for their division. Uh, <laughs> in, in, in my case, in the MP fifties, I'm sorry. I love, you know, champions landing is gorgeous, but, but 50 year old pro men, shouldn't be playing 11,000 foot courses with uh, OB and uh, 410. Well, they should uh, at least change carries. the T pads. They should at least change the T's for you guys. A hundred percent. In fact, and you know, and, and you brought up Eric McCabe. So I'll, 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 I did talk to him quite a bit this week and he really was more in a, uh, you know, a player mode. You know, this is a, an earlier part of him. Um, you know, again, PDGA, the dynamic discs is, you know, now part of house of discs. So there's another whole uh, machine working there. So it wasn't exactly the days of old, like dynamic. Disc was running this entire uh, operation. So Eric came in and, you know, he, he saved Peter Pan with some changes there at the last second. And I know he did a lot of work ahead of time 
in capacities of trying to mark the courses correctly and things like that. But uh, I, I don't think he had a, a huge, uh, a monstrous role. Like we think that he would mm. um, in that case, uh, in that scenario. Well, uh, you can't when you're playing and you're trying to win a world championship, yeah. you know, no, and I wouldn't yeah. expect him to. That's why, <laughs> that's why I was like, well, he's not there. So, you know, that's part of, part of the reason for me. Yeah. All right. I mean, he came in, uh, I'll give another course example. Um, you know, and here's another, just to add on to what I was talking about the, uh, the FP 40, the FP 50, the MP 60 and the MP 65. So these folks played a final nine of 5,384 feet, which was longer than the entire 18 hole course. They played three times during the world championship and slightly under the other course that they played at 5,600 during the world championships, 18 holes. So that in itself was <laughs> like, I'm not sure who's making these decisions. Uh, uh, you know, we need somebody in the pre-planning situation as well to be well-versed in all the variances. It's so much more difficult than uh, designing for FPO, MPO. Um, you know, where, where we really only have two skill sets that we're really trying to test them all where, you know, the age protected, you really do. I mean, otherwise, you know, and I, I say this a lot, it's like, uh, the courses should fit the age group. Otherwise we'll play open, you know, yeah, we should play open. I mean, so if somebody's playing MP 50, when they've got open skills, they're either got a nagging injury, they're hurt, their the back is bothering them. I mean, there's a number of things. Um, you know, so we need to adjust that type of stuff too. That's, that's something I'd really love to see get dialed in. We were doing pretty good for a few years in there. Um, but we need, we need players, you know, it may, may be a, a form of, uh, a semi-retirement for, you know, some of the folks on, on tour currently, and that's being able to really assess proper courses for, uh, for the skills at hand. Absolutely. Well, uh, one of the for things too, that. I was th ahead, thinking just the last thing I'll, I'll put in on, on that subject is I think it's to the point now when I see the divisions and I'm looking at how many people are playing all these divisions, which was incredible for the uh, Masters Worlds, but at what point can you just be like, hey, they're all different tournaments? And we can and we can uh, and we can put forward our most effort to the MP40, to the MP55, to, and they're all just different tournaments in different places. And these people can plan on going to their own thing and feel, feel like, uh, I don't know, a little more special, you know, instead of, I know a lot of, it's funny. Cause you talk to a lot of people who play the tournament and it's like, Oh, I get to go see my family again. And I get to see old people that I I've played with for a long time and everything. But I also think it'd be kind of special to see those to where MP 40, it's just, that's the tournament. And I, then maybe I think when it gets bigger, you could do that. I don't think it's at that level now. But like, well, why not? Well, I, I just don't think that I, I, I think what you were saying, I think a lot of people want to have like everyone come together. Sure. Is all I'm saying. But I could see, I could see like as some of the players that are on tour now, because, you know, the, the tour is way more popular now. Disc golf pros right now are way more popular than they were 20 years ago. I could see you know, 10, 15 years from now when a lot of them retire from the pro tour and they want to go play something else and that could work. But uh, Jay, we do need to let you go. But before we let you go, we got to get at least one pet peeve out of you. Something that really, <laughs> really uh, gets under your skin, something you can't stand. Uh, it can be in tournaments. It can be outside of tournament play. Just something in disc golf that really gets you going. All right. I've got, I've got a question for you guys too, but maybe, maybe you'll let me hit that real quick. Let's see. I've, something that grinds me. Um, I, I guess an easy one is, uh, uh, people that people that putt out and then they disrespect the target by either tapping oh. the passion, the chains or tapping the top of it or, or whatever. I just, to me, it's like your time is the 30 seconds before while your disc is in the air, when your disc comes to rest. Boom, that's on you. Now it's somebody else's turn. Get your stuff out of there. I I'm about to put on that same target and you just riled it uh -huh. all up. <laughs> who was the one that who was the one that kicked it over? 
Bradley. Oh, I think Bradley. Bradley. <laughs> <laughs> I think Bradley. I think Bradley hammer kicked that thing. Yeah, <laughs> that that might be the ultimate basket disc for sure. <laughs> I think that one comes with the suspension. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. You said you had a question. We'll, we'll let you shoot a question our way real quick. Okay. Cause you guys will chew on this. Cause this is right down y'all's alley. All right. So this is hole number nine at champions landing. Uh, you guys played it, uh, just at the EDO. This is, uh, it Great shoots hole. out of the tunnel down to the little space with the sidewalk. What is it like? Uh, 760 feet then it banks up mm -hmm. to the right it makes yep. a horseshoe it's blind all right you guys know it so coming out of the gates the way the pro tour played it is coming out of the gates uh if you do not clear the cabbagery uh drop you zone. go to the drop zone right speed of play all these different things but once you make it out of the gate there there is an ob line on the right and there's a natural one left on the sidewalk uh and you guys played it take it where it last was in bounds. Well, the, uh, for worlds, they actually just put drop zone and, you know, here's where, yep. It is absolutely on the player to know the rules of the course at the time. However, however, that was one of those ones where the tournament was really pretty fresh. We all kind of understood that whole, it really just makes sense the way you guys played it. I, mm -hmm. the other way is just like, what you're going to penalize, you're going to give somebody that really shanked it a benefit, and then you're going to give somebody that really risked it out uh, a, pen a, a double penalty by taking them way back. And that's my opinion on it. But but what I want to throw at you guys is, is the next time that that round was played, multiple groups in multiple divisions discovered that that hole was played incorrectly. The PDGA was notified immediately when one of the groups noticed that it was played wrong. And the theory was, Hey, y'all probably need to put a bulletin out there and let everybody clue in to like, Hey, you need to double check the rules of number nine. And then you need to ask yourself, did I play that hole correctly? So, uh, the PDJ did nothing. So I went back in competition. I'm like, wait a second. We had this at the USDGC where they had a hole like that. They put out a bulletin, the PDJ put out a bulletin. And then it was up to, and this is, I'm, I'm saying man up because this was MPO. You, if you did that, you need to turn yourself in and take your, yeah. take your medicine. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought that was a perfect way to do it. And 17 people came forward that year and much respect. You weren't cheating. You just didn't get it right. And you paid the price and you're moving on. Now, the PDJ decided not to do that. And so then it falls on the players to kind of like what run around and start asking yeah. people. And then it came to the point where we're like, are they going to do anything or not? It's the semifinals. Oh, it sounds, Oh, there's some action. The PDJ is walking around and trying to find somebody, but Oh, it's almost two minutes. I don't want to bother somebody when they're playing. And then now that's going to affect placing and it's going to affect payout and it's going to affect. Oh, wow. So how do we deal with that guys? You guys could chew on that. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, I think at the end of the day, the PDGA needs more pressure. You, we, you know, with podcasts, with people on social media, with professionals, with who, everyone, they got to they got to hold them accountable. We're paying them. We're paying their salaries. We need to hold them accountable. And if they don't do better, well, unfortunately, there's nothing we can do. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Jay, I you know, appreciate jumping on, man. This was fun. We'll have to have you come on another time because uh, I think everyone really enjoyed listening to those stories and whatnot from you, and we appreciate you. Let me leave it with the membership out here. Everybody that's watching. Also, you know, the, shout, out, shout out some stuff that you're working on, too. I know you guys do a lot for the game, too, so let people know how they can support you guys. I appreciate that. Uh, uh, just something for the listeners. Um, you know, I, I'm lucky. I've got a good, lot of good relationships and people, uh, ask for my opinion and, and I'm glad to give it and things like that, but we get made fun of quite a bit. Why? Because we don't vote. You know, we want to talk about all the things that are going on in the background and things like that. But the membership that, that doesn't vote really has no say. If you vote, then you can say something. In fact, every event has a little, uh, link on there where you can leave feedback the TD reads that the PDJ reads that those are the two most important people that you can get feedback directly to. If you do it in a succinct and respectable way, 
you know, going and just blowing off and rah, you know, we all do that in the parking lot, you know, but <laughs> if you want to make change, you got to vote, you got to be able to voice your opinion and do it the right way. Yeah. And I think we can get some things done y'all. Uh, but, uh, yeah, man, I'm, I'm celebrating. This is my 25th, uh, year of touring and playing in seven or states or more. I, I you guys, again, we're, we're going to run some stats, but I can't find anybody that's been doing it longer than me. Although you do have a host uh, Brody, that's probably next in line. Uh, he, uh, he's been, he's been out there for a long time. So when I hang up my sneakers, uh, I, I'm pretty sure you, you've, you've been doing it every year too, since then for at least seven States or more. That's what I'm considering touring. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, so is there anything that, on that, on is there that anywhere, accomplishment, honestly? Is there anywhere people can support you? Um, support yeah, stuff that you guys too. Yeah, so out to what you guys are doing. Yeah, I apologize. We're old school. You know, Des does have an Instagram now. I, I I jump on Facebook and throw some things out there, man. We do love to hear from all the fans and stuff. Uh, Yeti Disc Custom stuff can always be found at DiscNation.com. Uh, my sponsors that have been with me forever and ever. I've been uh, Innova for over 20 years now. Uh, there, I will drop a little hint, hint. Uh, those of you that like the sweet Yeti fire habanero pineapple hot sauce, my uh, sponsor, oh. Big Big <laughs> Country Beef Jerky. Just saying, I've got a nice. test batch in this week. We're, we're dialing it in. That's going to be awesome. Grip equipment, Zuka, birdie bag, and, of course, the educational disc golf experience. We're a 501c3. That means we're a nonprofit. All the money that comes in goes right back out. We've turned millions of kids on to disc golf and introduced them, and we are going to plant this year our 300th permanent course on a school campus wow that's, that's incredible. awesome that's insane so you can send in paypal on the website if you want to uh we love what jomez is doing those guys are you know uh yuli and, and brody when you guys uh, miss out on that uh, star frame people do notice and the well, kids are not me on you. it's not me <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't put that on me it's not me this year <laughs> um, we appreciate all you do. Uh, your big reason disc golf is is where it's at right now. So, and we appreciate you t taking the time to jump on tonight and talk to us. Absolutely, yeah, guys. Tell Des, tell Des we said hi too. Of course, we will. Love the show. She's going out to hang out with 280 women at the Throw Pink Team Invitational out in North Carolina. Ooh. So that's another there great organization. Sarah Nicholson doing great things for women's sports. Fantastic. Love to hear it. All right. You all have a great night. Appreciate you jumping on. Cheers.